welcome back to the channel. Here are the answers to the AMA, the Ask Me Anything video I did a few days ago. And so it'll watch out for all the cuts because I have to read them and then work out an answer and answer you. So let's get started. First up, we've got DR07828. Catchy, catchy handle, isn't it? Um, he or she asks, have you ever finished the X-Jet? I've been waiting since the late 90s, early 2000s, I think. Well, yes, so have I, but... <laughs> um, Yes, well, I have finished several X-Jets, so the prototypes have all worked, well, not all, but the later ones have worked really well. So why haven't I taken this to the next step? Well, there's a word that should sit over my desk, and it says focus. Um, as people who've been watching my channel or watch my videos for any length of time know, I have lots of interests. I have, I do lots of different things, you know, model aircraft, electronics, uh, engineering, all sorts of stuff. So. It's very, very easy to get sidetracked by new projects and things and to end up trying to do everything at once, in which case you get nothing done. The key to success in any field of endeavor is to focus on the things that are important. Now, the XJet uh, engine, I developed it, I got it running, I established the mechanisms by which it works so that I could um, further develop the product. But at this stage, it needs more resource than I have available. That means more money, more engineering equipment, more um, technology to continue the development and more money. And basically it's the point where it needs to go to the next level. I've, throughout my life, I've generally made my living by coming up with an idea, verifying that it's a practical idea, and then turning it into a commercial reality by creating a prototype, going out and raising funding, getting the funding in place, and then turning it into a profitable enterprise and then selling the whole thing lock, stock and barrel. That's what I enjoy. That's the fun. I, I'm a, I'm a salute. I'm a, I'm a problem solver, an ideas guy, and that's what I do. But once it gets to the point where it is able to turn a dollar, uh, I'm not. A, I don't want to be a manager, a CEO, or whatever. I just want to move on to the next project. Now, the X Jet has reached the point where it needs the injection of capital and other resources to take it to the next level. And to be honest, that is the hardest single step in any project development is actually taking your proven prototype out there to the market and then convincing other people to share your vision and to part with their hard-earned cash to bring it to the next level. And I just don't have the time. I'm old. Look at me. Old. Believe it or not, you know, this handsome, this, this, this young face betrays my real age. But um, yeah, I just don't have the enthusiasm, the time or the inclination to take that product to the next stage. So it is, it is in stasis. It is sitting there. I may one day, I may do it if I ever live that long, but hey, it may not, it may. Also, the market's changed a little bit. Um, at the time I started that product, there was a huge market for a very cheap jet engine. But now, um, I don't know that that market actually exists anymore. Electric power is taking over the very cheap thing. You know, you can buy fantastic EDFs and look at where drones are going. It's all electric now. Model aircraft and drones are electric and cars are electric. I think manned aviation will eventually go electric. So a noisy power plant that, um, you know, has benefits but creates a lot of noise and, and uses fossil fuels. I don't think the same market exists now as it existed 10 or, what is it, nearly 20 years ago now when I developed that particular engine. So there you go. Scooter FPV asks, how come you don't fix the left side lens on your glasses, spectacles or whatever? I've been wondering that for over two years now. What are you talking about, Scooter? Oh, look at that, cracked. How did that happen? <laughs> well, no, seriously. Um, yeah, I broke these a long, long time ago. And how did they do it? I walked into a door, walked into a door, like that. How did they, they manage to do that? Well, no, I wasn't drunk or anything else. Um, I had a vitreous detachment in my eye some years ago, which has meant that it's not the best functioning part of my body. I won't tell you which part is, but um, it's not the best functioning part of my body. So my vision through here is not always particularly good. And when the eye was not working that well, because it comes and goes, it's really annoying. Actually, if you have, if you lose a sight in one eye, I think your body can adapt quite well. If you have a situation where you have a vitreous detachment and the, the vision comes and goes, that's a lot harder to deal with because your brain can't make up its mind whether you should be looking through this eye or not. So that really gets quite frustrating at times. Anyway, I digress. So yeah, so I walked into a wall and broke the glasses. And because this eye doesn't function that well, I don't even notice it. I really don't notice that the crack is there. Other people notice it and obviously like Scooter ask, why? And Interestingly enough, I got an email from Joshua Bardwell a few weeks ago, I must follow it up, in which he said that um, a lot of people had seen my broken glasses and thought that they might do a bit of crowdfunding and buy me a pair. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, 
And I, who knows, I may follow that up. Uh, I'll have to get a prescription, go to the optometrist and get them to put the little fancy things on because my prescription's probably changed. I got these glasses so long ago that I really don't think, I mean, half the time I don't wear them because they're so bad um, that they make things worse rather than better. But yeah, I should I should get new glasses. Maybe I will do that as a as an increased priority. I, I have to prioritize things because, um, you know, I, I'm not a rich YouTuber. <laughs> the reason these channels continue going is because I'm willing to make life sacrifices, get by on a shoestring, uh, and sometimes that means putting off things that otherwise you might do, like new glasses, yeah, it's a low priority. I'd rather eat and keep a roof over my head than have new glasses. So that's what I do. And Adil Shah says, what software do you use to slap graffiti all over the place? Well, actually, I'm gonna do a whole video on that. It is a piece of software from Blackmagic Design. It's called Fusion. Fusion is it's not Fusion 360 from Autodesk. It is Fusion 9, or we're now Fusion 16, there's a new version out, which is by Blackmagic Design. It's just what's called a visual effects and compositing software. And it's actually become part of DaVinci Resolve, which is the video editing software I use. Now this is a whole video and a half on its own, so I'm not gonna go into it too deeply, but I use DaVinci Resolve to do my video editing, and I use Fusion to do my visual effects. So stay tuned, there will be a video coming up on this because I think it's a piece of software that a lot of people don't know about and the price is right. You can use it for free. Um, there is a studio version which costs 300 bucks, but the free version is like 95% of the studio version, no watermarks or anything. So a lot of people are now starting to use it in preference to things like Adobe Premiere, which costs you what, 30 bucks a month or something and forever. Um, free forever is a much better price. So yeah, I'll do a video on that and fill you in on the details. And Adil also asks, what is the recommendations for a media drone for filming local news with local newsworthy activities? Well, it's got to be a DJI, to be totally honest. I mean, um, DJI make the best commercial drones. The Parrot and Affy, I've heard a lot of good things about that. This isn't an area that I delve deeply into because I, I haven't had a real big interest in camera drones with gimbals, you know, just positioning them and because no that's that's not my thing um, I'm more of a as you know I'm a, I'm a very competent freestyler and a highly qualified race uh, drone racing pilot <laughs> I lie um, no I just I just never really appealed to me so I haven't tested I haven't reviewed a phantom they offered me a phantom DJI said do you want a phantom to review and I said no it's not my target audience so and I'm not into taking free stuff um, on the basis that well oh, it's free I'll have it I take free stuff only when I can see there's a value to my audience to review it because I'm not about collecting. I'm not, I'm not here to accumulate lots of stuff that I don't want or need. So yeah, I'd say look at the DJI or the Parrot and Affy. Those are probably the two most practical ones. Now the, the I would say if you're in an area where there are things like um, exclusion zones, if the geofencing is going to be a problem, go for the Parrot and Affy and you can then fly it where you couldn't fly the DJI products because they, quite honestly, they're a bit of a pain in the backside. People come out to our airfield to fly and they can't because it's an airfield and DJI says you're not allowed to fly here. Even though the people who bring their drones out have all the necessary certifications to do so, the process involved in getting it unlocked is not always an easy or a quick one. So Parrot and Affy, yeah, give it a go. And the Eveling asks, what's in the hangars at the airfield? Can you guess? Actually, a few of them, the minority of them, have aircraft in them. I think there's only two or three hangars that have aircraft. The rest of them are basically empty. The airfield is run down, the airfield is barely used, and so you don't, the hangars are barely, you know, barely used too, so they're pretty much empty. And Blackie's Man Cave says, when are you doing the Australian drone rules video? Well, very soon, Blackie, because I've been doing a lot of research, a lot, a lot, a lot, and another lot of research, uh, because it's very, it's a twisted web of government documents and things. It's not just the rules, there's all sorts of things that, I researched what's involved when they make the rules, have they followed the right procedures? And no, they haven't. I don't think they have. I think the, the government has actually violated its own guidelines for making rules when it comes to regulating drones in Australia. So stay tuned for that. It's a much bigger video than I'd originally envisaged and it opens a lot of doors and there are skeletons in those doors. So don't miss that video coming up soon, hopefully this week. GH Dunedin asks, were you able to progress the collision detection avoidance project at all? That's my sense and avoid project. Yes, I was. Um, again, this is a bit like the XJet. This is a, a focus thing. Now, I got the product to the point where I'd proven that my ideas were viable. They worked. I could, I could make it do what I said it would do. Then comes the hard part, condensing it all down into a package small enough to fit on your average drone or even in a manned aircraft. And that requires or required a lot more time, effort, resource and money than I had available. So the only logical thing was to hand it on to someone who's in a position to do that. 
I had a lot of interest actually from large aerospace companies. Some of the big, big names in the aerospace industry were knocking on my door saying, hey, hey, you know, we'd like to have a look at that. And I, because I'm so old, um, I've had experience with large companies before and generally they don't turn out to be very good ones. Large companies have the imperative profit at all cost and their ethics, their morality, their, you know, they, they're just not, often not nice companies to deal with because they're driven by this profit imperative. And if they can screw you, they will because that, their responsibility isn't to you, it's to the shareholders. So I am a little, always a bit wary of dealing with large companies. I prefer to deal with smaller companies that have basically, especially if they're owned by the people that run them, they tend to have a little better outlook on how to treat your business partners. So I, uh, I was approached by a European company that's in the aerospace industry, small, much, much smaller company, and I put to them, well, you know, the bottom line for me is I want an open source available of this product once it's reached the point where it can be actually manufactured and shipped. And I, it won't be the full featured version, of course, because you reserve that for your commercial clients and that's where you make your money, but open source, I want it available for anyone that wants to use it for recreational purposes. And they agreed to that, which is brilliant. Now they've spent quite a bit of time and effort and money researching and developing and continuing the product. It continues to evolve. There are a few hurdles that we need to address, we need to get over. Um, those will be addressed in the fullness of time. But my real concern right now is that this may become, it may be, uh, by the time it's finished, it may be no longer required because we've got things, electronic conspicuity. We've got the regulators saying, oh, you've got to have transponders in your drones and transponders in your planes. Then we don't need sense and avoid because everyone knows where everyone is. And that's quite possibly what's going to happen. So I guess if I'd given it to a very large aerospace company, they'd have thrown millions at it and got it out the door in six months. Gave it to a very small company, but and because they have fewer resources, it takes much longer. So we may have missed the window of opportunity with that one, which I... That's one of the risks you take in business. I mean, I spent an inordinate amount of time working on that, and I would just write that time off because it's just one of the, the investment risks with business. And same, oh, I better put that back on so that the white balance is good. Uh, so that, um, yeah, it's one of the risks you take. I knew about it, they knew about it, and I don't think anyone's going to be totally gutted if it no longer has a place in the market. But that's what happened to it. Graham Wilson asks, what are you doing about CASA and their stupid rules, <laughs> stupid new rules? Well, trust me, uh, I'm working hard on that and um, I'd like to think that we could embarrass them into making some changes, but the reality is that this is nothing about safety. There's nothing we can do except front up with a large amount of money and outbid Google for that airspace. Sorry, but I think that's what we're basically gonna be faced with in Australia. I'm sorry for you guys. And Mac RM says, can you share some of your makeup tips and does your wife help? Well, no, I do her makeup actually. And uh, we beauty vloggers don't share our tips. That's one of the things, if I shared all my tips, then you guys would all start your own beauty vlogging channel and I would lose my audience. I'm sorry, mate, I'm not prepared to share that. And who have we got here? Uh, Martin Venter says, do you even wear underwear whatsoever? Well, no, did you not get the reference? Schwarzenegger, commando. James White challenges me on when spring starts. Is it at the equinox or is it at the beginning of the month? Well, I prefer to take an optimistic outlook and say when it comes to spring, which is a season that oh, I look forward to because things start getting warmer, I want it to start as soon as possible. So I say it starts in the Southern Hemisphere on the 1st of September. When it comes to autumn, however, I believe it doesn't start until the autumn equinox, which is the middle of, in this part of the world, the middle of something, March, I believe. Uh, or something like that. Anyway, so yeah, I just look, you know, I just take an optimistic outlook. People debate it. Is it, you know, um, really the beginning of the month or the middle of the month? I don't know. I don't think it really matters. Hand Dog Mech asks whether our CAA considers model aircraft drones as the FAA does. Yes, all around the world, regulators have lumped model aircraft in with drones because either they're incredibly stupid or it fits the narrative, it enables, because remember this isn't about safety. It doesn't matter that model aircraft have this really good record of safety. Um, the whole goal here is to clear out the airspace that we are using, whether we're flying drones or model aircraft, clear it out for Google and their friends. So that's why they, they just, you know, if you, if you exist in the zero to 400 foot, you're a drone, doesn't matter. In fact, I see in the UK, they even were going to include control line planes until recently. I'm gonna do a video on that. The UK have announced some changes or the government's told the regulators to go back and rethink this whole thing about models, fortunately. So there will be some changes to the proposed regulations in the UK coming up. But I couldn't believe control line models were going to be regulated like 
RC models and drones. Seriously, honestly. And Wiz Breckman, the RC enthusiast asks, what was your first experience with model aviation? Well, I think I was about seven years old and a friend of the family bought me a little kit, sticks of balsa with tissue and rubber band and um, basically balsa cement. And I had to build this thing on a, on a board with a plan and glue all the little bits together and cover it in tissue and spray it with water. And that got me fascinated. I got totally fascinated after that. I was able to build something that flew and it just, you know, the spark, bing, that was it. From that point on, I was an avid model builder and flyer and I've never stopped. Well, I did have a bit of a hiatus in the middle when I was busy with other things, but you know, I was every, Every day, I was when I got home from school, I'd be out to my little shed and building models to crash on the weekend. And that went on for many, many years until I discovered girls. Then things happened, then things changed a bit, <laughs> other priorities, you know. <laughs> and so like most people, once you discover girls, model aircraft get put to the side for a little while. But I'm back at full force now. Justin Burke asks, will you be my dad? Well, Justin, I might be, better ask your mother. <laughs> oh, I live in dread of Father's Day. Thousands of cards from around the world that I'd forgotten all about, anyway, no, I joke. And not a question, but a comment that I thought was worthy of inclusion. Alan Moore says to be truly cinematic, you need to add a shallow field of depth, color grading and resize to 21.9 to get the black bars in the 16.9 format used on YouTube. Is that better? <laughs> and air-headed aviator asks, as a question, how did you get into RC, Bruce? Well, as I said, I started off with little rubber-powered balsa and tissue models, and then I just kept building models, free flight mainly. I didn't do that much control line. I probably had only three or four control line models, but a lot of free flight models, because I really enjoyed the challenge of trimming them out and getting them to fly on their own without me interfering with them. And I guess by the time I was about 12, I had saved enough of my hard-earned money, and trust me, it was hard-earned mowing lawns, raking the drive, and all that sort of stuff, earning you know just little bits of money, and my parents came up with half the money, and I sent off to England, jolly old England, for a set of single-channel radio control set, radio control equipment. And it was really annoying, because we I got the money in December, just before Christmas, my parents gave me the balance of money. We went down to the post office and bought a postal order and sent it off to old Blighty and then waited, waited for the radio control equipment to come back. And in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Christmas is summer. So we have our summer holidays, the school holidays. And so the letter was sent off just before Christmas and I waited all through the summer holidays. And on the last day of my summer school holidays, the radio control equipment came back. So I spent a whole holidays in those days, it was six weeks, I think, and time drags so slowly when you're a young person in summer on your holidays, it's great, you know, your holidays seem to last forever. But I was waiting, waiting, and then of course it came, and that day, the next day I had to go to school. Oh, I was gutted, I wanted to stay home and play with my radio control gear, but <laughs> anyway, since then obviously I've just gone on like most people and bought different gear and so forth, but that's how I got into radio control. I bought a set of radio gear, and had an interminable wait for it to arrive. And Robotenko asks, a bit off topic, but do you know what happened to the Spectra 50 channel? They haven't posted anything in three years. That's a very good question. A lot of people would like to know. I've spoke to Mark and Mark said that it was simply that their work schedules no longer lined up. They did, I think, all worked at the same printing plant or something. And because of people, you know, schedules changing, they weren't able to all appear at the same time at the field to do the, the flying. It sounds a bit sus to me, to be totally honest. I think, now, I know also that the Pertuswell flying field was under jeopardy, whether they were going to increase the size of the golf course that was next door or whether they were going to do something else, put in squash court, I don't know. But the whole thing, I think, was a little bit up in the air. But what I think might have happened is that I, I suspect that Charlie propositioned Maureen and she flattened him and they were banished from the site forever. Um, who knows? Who knows? Because there was some pretty dodgy flying going on there. I wonder if they actually got themselves into so much trouble that they had to stop flying because, you know, the BMFA might have stepped in. Who knows? But yeah, it's a tragic loss. A tragic loss to the YouTube community. Those guys were just so funny. Um, I would really love to see them all get back together, even if just once and have another flying at the farm, that would be tremendous. You know, you can't go back, but I would love to see what they're doing now and just get them out there, maybe a weekend, you know, and just put it on YouTube. I'm sure it would be a roaring success and we'd all enjoy it, probably even more than they would. And Grey Raven asked, do you wear corporate coloured underwear? Well, we covered the commando situation, didn't we? But I do wear underwear actually. And yes, corporate underwear with epaulets. Oh, they're so uncomfortable. And Social Lives ask, AXN Floater, review of the new AXN? Same or same or, well, um, no, I don't have one. 
I, I had hoped that Hobby King would send me one, but obviously Hobby King, based on the feedback I got on RC Model Reviews when I suggested that that um, things are not as they once were in the hobby market in terms of quality and um, support, um, I, a lot of people just don't use Hobby King anymore, do they? I mean, they were the source for hobby products, and these days, not many people use them. I would have thought they would have therefore been out there pushing the product, but no, um, they haven't sent me one. I will be probably buying an AXN. From what I've seen, from what I've seen in other videos and talking to people, it's pretty much just they've used the same mouldings and everything, different motor, different motor, that's about it. I don't know if the new motor is better or worse. It was really hard to find a motor better suited to the AXN than the original one. It was just the right combination of power and current draw so you get a 20 minute flight out of your AXN. People tried putting bigger motors on and it just ruined the experience. And smaller motors ruined the experience. Really that, that AXN motor was the shizzle. So that would be the big thing to me. Is the motor as good as the original? So I don't know and one day I certainly hope to test it out. But um, yeah, um, I will be, um, in fact interesting, I, one of my videos appeared on their um, weekly video thing and they said everyone whose video appears in the weekly thing gets a $10 credit. Nope, didn't get it. <laughs> so. Yeah, maybe I'm really persona non grata, I don't know. And Adrian Ryan asks, why did you move from Australia? Well, because I wasn't living in America, I could hardly move from the USA. I was living in Australia, but no, good question. Um, I came here in the 1970s. The reason I came was because all my friends were getting married, settling down with kids, and so my social circle was growing smaller. And the ones that didn't get married, well, most of them were, oh no, hang on a minute, I should actually fix that. Uh, most of them were, getting into drugs and things and it wasn't my scene so I figured hey let's just try something new so I thought I'll come over to New Zealand which is a different country but it's not far away and it's the cultures are fairly similar I'll come over here and I might spend a few months just you know traveling around perhaps doing some odd jobs who knows so I came to New Zealand never went well I have been back for various reasons but um, I liked it so much I decided to stay and it's not the you know it is a pretty good place to live I've got to say there are a lot of places that I wouldn't live in the USA for because I just don't like the way the Constitution has been ripped to shreds on the premise of safety. I would rather die on my feet than live on my knees, basically. That's midnight oil quote. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of person I am. And Australia's become little USA, so I wouldn't go back there. Um, Britain's got its own problems. You know, you like to be stabbed in the streets if you walk down London. Is it, New Zealand has its problems, but by and large, um, it's a very expensive place to live. You know, everything costs more here and people get paid less. So it's, that's one of the reasons I have a fairly meagre lifestyle. But it, all in all, it is a good place to live. Otherwise, I'd be living somewhere else. So yeah, um, that's why I came to New Zealand. Better lifestyle, better quality of life. And Shorty Tall asks, do you ever have issues with birds not liking your models or multi-rotors? Well, yeah, I actually replied to that on the video and sent a link to one of my videos where I was mobbed by a group of birds. But at the airfield, we have no trouble no trouble with birds at all because we I consider it a responsibility to keep the airfield clear of birds. So when I see birds, I chase them. Chase them with a multi-rotor, chase them with a fixed wing. We call it bird herding. We clear the airfield of those birds whenever possible. So now even magpies will, if magpies are flying along the, the airfield and they see a model, they land and they walk past the model flying area and then take off and fly again. They're too scared to fly past because we give them such a hard time and all you, you know, greenies who say oh you shouldn't be mean to the birds well it's saving their lives if they're not there they're not going to get chopped to pieces by an aircraft propeller you know a manned aircraft bird strike 400 million dollars a year in damage we're trying to prevent that keep the skies safer keep the birds safer we we don't hurt the birds we just scare them away i mean it's common sense isn't it and enrique kramer says what is your idea about a youtube substitute you had announced a video on this but i believe you still have not issued it you are correct i have not issued it but I do have an idea that I believe will really challenge YouTube as a platform for social media video and also will provide monetization. That's the big thing that's been missing with other things like BitChute. You know, I mean, BitChute, how do you turn your hard work into cash with BitChute? Yeah, you, you, know, you can't. And also, we have the problem that BitChute is, you know, it's one side. It's one side. If BitChute decided, well, we're going to take that video down, you don't have an option. The video goes down. A bit shoot, suddenly, if, you know, if the regulators come and say to bit shoot, you can't do this, you know, we want you to put, you know, age restrictions and, and whatever or you know, whatever. They've got to follow the rules, right? One site is one point of failure. Bit shoot is one site. It's the access point to all those videos. And so that's the vulnerable part of bit shoot and the other um, library and things like that. They've all got a single point of failure which means that they can be controlled, they can be restricted, they can be censored, you know, they, you can end up with a similar YouTube situation where one, all the coins are in one basket, 
And that's the big problem. So the system I've come up with is distributed processing, distributed serving, and distributed access. Those are the three things you need to make sure that no one's going to basically abuse the system that you create. And I say I will be doing a video on that fairly shortly. These priorities. I've got to, the Outlaw 250 video is far more important. Many people have said, "Where's the Outlaw 250 video? It, it's on this computer here." Uh, <laughs> so stay with me. Bear with me on that, please. And Stacey Arbisher says, how did you come up with the name XJet? Well, it's the name I gave to a jet engine that I was developing, as mentioned earlier in this AMA. Um, and I created a YouTube channel because I was going to sort of document my progress with this jet engine on the channel. And it just stuck. So that's it. It's basically just the name I gave to my jet engine technology. And yeah, couldn't be bothered changing the name of the channel, so that's what you get. So I think that's all the questions that were on there. So yeah, hopefully you've learned something. If there's anything else you want to know, I'll do these on a time to a regular sort of basis because things change, people want to know other stuff. Hopefully you have learned something. Um, and hopefully you'll still watch the videos, but yeah, there you go. Uh, just a little bit more background for people that don't know, because this seems to be like a, you know, tell us about yourself, Bruce. Um, for people that don't know, I actually, you know, this whole the drone hysteria now, where drones are going to, you know, be weaponized. People can put bombs on drones, and that's why we need these rules. Well, no, it's a load of rubbish because we've had the ability for people to create weaponized drones for 20, nearly 20 years. It was in 2002, I think, I published a, a paper uh, which said that you can build, and some of you may remember this was in the media, you could, if someone could build their own DIY cruise missile from parts they can buy on eBay and from the local hardware store. This is when I was developing my jet engines because I realized, wow, I can build a really powerful jet engine in my garage for, for pennies and I could make a cruise missile. I could put a flight controller and some servos and whatever. And so I, I built one. I built one. In fact, um, people are probably wondering where that is. I have no idea where that is. Can't tell you, I'm afraid. But anyway, I got into a lot of trouble over that. A huge amount of trouble uh, with the government. Um, unusual for me, wasn't it? Being at odds with the, with the powers that be. Hmm. Who'd have thought? But yeah, uh, but I pointed out that, hey, you know, this could be done now. For a few hundred bucks, someone could build a missile with a range of hundreds of miles that would fly at very high speeds and be very hard to detect. And at that stage, very hard to knock out of the sky. And the interestingly enough, I got feedback from people in the US military saying, yeah, we know we're really concerned. These are people about, you know, this is the military, this is the president, and this is the people polishing guns, uh, you know, on the parade ground. These people were about here. And they contacted me and said, yeah, we know. We know we're aware of this risk. And we're trying to convince people further up the chain that this is a risk. And, but the people at the top, oh, no, no problems. Oh, don't, you're just talking through a hole in your head. So I built a proof of concept cruise missile to show people. But then um, I had to come to an agreement with the powers that be. Otherwise, you know, my future was in question not to take that any further. So I didn't. But um, as I say, um, I'll put a link in the description of this video to my Aardvark site, which is a daily blog I've been publishing for nearly 25 years now. Um, and it'll point to a page where I outlined the case that, yeah, people could build their own low-cost cruise missile, otherwise known as a drone, and deliver quite sensibly sized payloads, you know, 10 kilograms or more, over very long distances with great ease and accuracy. And the fact that that capability has existed for nearly 20 years, but it has never actually been used, speaks to the fact that the threat really isn't as big as I originally thought, or as big as is being claimed now. Because why wouldn't people have done that? Well, the reality is that if people want to create problems, there's much more cost-effective and simple and reliable ways to do it. You go out, you hire a U-Haul truck, and you park it outside the federal building, load it with fertilizer and diesel fuel, and there's your answer. That's what that's what they do. That's the way. That's the practical, simple way that bad actors do bad things. Or you hijack a couple of airliners. That's an even simpler way to do it. Um, so yeah, it, you see, the thing is that we're being fed a line. Oh, this is all about safety. We've got to compromise. We've got to restrict your your activities and license you and register you because it's going to keep us safe when there's no such, that's all such utter rubbish. It's all about commercial imperatives. But there'll be another video coming up on that. Don't worry about that. A rant, in fact. A rant coming up on that. But yeah, that's me. I pointed out the danger in 2002, and nobody took any notice of it until now, because now the reason is they it's still nothing to do with the danger. It's to do with commercialization. Dollars are far more important than human lives at the top level of power. It's all about the money. Sad, isn't it? Very sad indeed. Never mind. That's it. 
I will hope to end on a cheerier note, but I won't. I'll leave you with that one to think about. Do the comments with you. You've got anything to say? Any more questions to ask? I'll put them in my next AMA response and we'll take it from there. In the meantime, I hope you're enjoying the videos. If you've got suggestions, always looking for suggestions for videos. I always want to make better content more suited to what you want to see. So if you've got any suggestions, stick them in there as well. Stay tuned. More stuff coming up on this channel and RC model reviews. And thank you to my Patreon supporters. You know why. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Okay, Blind Vision X asks, what really happened to the rocket? Where did you put it? Well, honestly, I've got no idea where it is. I can say it could be anywhere. I can't really comment on that at all. At all. Much.